podcast that looks at all things fandom and art and looks at it through a social science lens to bring about a better tomorrow. I am your host, Forward Progress. I'm joined today by a couple of wonderful guests that we're going to get to in just a moment. I did want to start off, this is going to be a little bit of a different episode than what we normally do. It's going to be a very personal one for me, um, so I have a of an introduction, so to speak, to this topic here. Recording this podcast is happening in May of 2020. And a few weeks ago, something occurred to me that I hadn't really thought about for a while, but uh, it, it hit me like a ton of bricks. So in April of 2010, um, I took a trip to a doctor uh, to get myself just uh, taken care of, get a physical, get some uh, things with my mental health taken care of. And while I was at the doctor's office that day, I was asked if I would be okay with getting some other testing done just for the sake of having that testing done. They recommend it for everybody if I hadn't been tested in a while. So I was like, sure, why the heck not? And not thinking I... Um, had anything to worry about, took all those tests and, uh, took a little bit to get all the results back, but I found out, uh, in April of 2010, I uh, got the results that, uh, came back that I was actually HIV positive. And last month, April of 2020, marked 10 years since my diagnosis. And some people know that I have talked about this before in various presentations to an extent, but realizing that it had been 10 years of my life now living with this uh, virus, um, I wanted to do an episode where we touched upon some subjects that stem off from the fact of individuals um, like myself who have contracted this illness, uh, this disease, this virus, whatever you want to call it, and the social implications that lie within having this condition and ways of coping and moving forward um, while living with it. So I'm joined today uh, by, of course, the lovely and talented Nova Rose, my, my love of my life, my one and only. And uh, joining us today for this special edition of the podcast, we have, uh, oh gosh, how many credits can I list? Actor, writer, director, all around great friend for many years, uh, our good friend Josh Dorsheimer joining us today. Hello. All right. Well, thank you. Thank you both for joining us. Uh, Obviously, as I said in the introduction there, we are going to be discussing topics stemming from um, those living with HIV and stigma around it. Now, um, Josh, I'm going to start with you. Obviously, um, I've known you for many years, and one of the interesting things since you've been friends with me and uh, and also other individuals that we know and uh, that we both know that are also HIV positive, So I'm going to start off asking you a general question of how does it feel, how do you feel your role is as a friend to somebody who is, um, has that condition? Do you feel any sense, uh, is there anything that you feel any differently or sense of special um, care when interacting with your friends who may have that condition? Uh. Yeah, I I definitely think that there is uh, it might it might be a different answer than what others would think. I think I kind of have like a sense of duty, if that makes sense. Um, you know, uh, obviously when I I have a good handful of friends who are HIV positive, and each time uh, I you know learn of a diagnosis, it, it makes me well. It's gotten better in the future, but the, the very first person to ever come out to me, you know, saying that they were diagnosed. Ultimately, this big, this big uh, uh, worry kind of thing, and it turned into like, oh my gosh, I need to, you know, 
protect this person. <laughs> um, <laughs> and while that like knee jerk uh, scared reaction is uh, no longer kind of, I mean, there's still concern there, but you know, so far with everything. Now, I think my general outlook on it is that as a friend, it is something that uh, almost like kind of uh, way it's sort of like being a friend with somebody who's part of the LGBT community, even though I am part of the LGBT community, that I have like a duty as a friend to be an ally and a good ally. And that doesn't just mean like, oh, I'm your friend. It also means like, hey, you know, putting the work in when they need it and when they when when they require you know some outside help because it's it's a difficult thing to kind of go through by yourself i would imagine so i kind of um even though it doesn't make me see my friends any differently i, I do realize that there's a kind of that sense of duty there uh, as a friend to uh be there for them in different ways uh and then it kind of just gives me a connection to the community too if that makes sense yeah, no, absolutely. Rose, I'm going to put you on the spot here. I know how much you love when I do that, but do, 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 do. <laughs> you are in the role of being in a relationship with somebody who has HIV yes. and you yourself do not. Correct. Um, so, and we're going to, we're going to discuss some of the realities of what it means to live with HIV throughout the episode, but as a general starting point, do you think it affects, and I, and, and I understand this is weird considering we're going to talk about our relationship with you right in front of me, but do you feel there is an impact, and it can be both po either positive, negative, um, neutral, however, of the fact that you are with somebody who is HIV positive versus being with somebody who wouldn't be? Honestly, it's one of those things that doesn't, it's weird. It like, it doesn't cross my mind very much, to be honest. Like, if anything, like, especially with the COVID scare, like, I'm worried about, you know, that aspect of it. But overall, like, I don't, I don't really treat you any differently or I don't, uh, I think if anything, you know, being I guess there there's a hesitation when like sexually active, but for the most part there's really no difference for me at least. Mhm. Mm there there's a lot to get out there and I don't want to make assumptions about our listeners and what you do or don't know coming into um listening to this podcast and and topics within that we're going to discuss. But uh suffice to say um, obviously I have lived for 10 years now, um, as an HIV positive individual. So the diagnosis of, of being HIV positive is no longer the instant death threat that it was 30 to 40 years ago. The advancement in medication is astounding to the point where I... The virus is literally undetectable in my body. Um, I take one pill a day, and as long as, and I've been on the same medication for years, and I have to get tested several times a year now. And every time that my tests come back, it has been consistent for years upon years now that the virus is undetectable in my body. You can't, it doesn't even show up in lab results. Now, what does that mean? Um, it doesn't mean that it's cured, but it does mean that it is essentially ineffective. It is not do, it is beaten back to a point where it can't do anything. And not only is it beaten back to that point, it is sh been shown through studies that it is nigh impossible for me to transmit it to another person. Uh, the possibility still technically exists, but I believe it's something like 99% that I will never transmit it to another person as long as I maintain on the medication and continue um, with treatment as such. 
uh, without interruption. And then um, speaking sexually, the addition of using a condom adds another layer of protection to where it's like 99.99 repeating percent certain that I will not transmit it. Hence why I don't think about it very much. And that's, and that's the reason I wanted to bring that up is overall, while it is a factor in my life, it's amazing to me these days how much of a non-factor it is. Um, looking back 10 years ago, I never would have expected it. And... When I had my first appointment with the HIV specialist after getting diagnosed, one of the things they told me was that one of the biggest things that they treat is not even necessarily the virus, but the social implications that occur from somebody getting diagnosed. And this is a large part of why I wanted to invite our good friend Josh on the podcast today uh, I can't even remember what year it was when this project started, but um, I don't know if uh, I'll, uh, you know what, I can open up the floor to you, uh, Mr. Josh, if you want to talk a little bit about the beginnings of a certain project that we, um, that you, you started and I got uh, luckily to be a part of. Well, uh, I think it began in 2012 is the, the day, is the year that I think that we, if I'm correct, the original, original, original piece. And um, basically, uh, it started out as, um, so, uh, I guess I should say the name of the piece, shouldn't I? <laughs> <laughs> At some point, we should tell people. <laughs> so, so, um, uh, myself and a couple, uh, a friend of mine who uh, is also a playwright, I don't think they would mind if I use their name. Do you mind if I name drop? You may name drop as much as you would like. All right. Well, my dear friend, Nicole Weirbrook, is their name. And uh, I, we uh, started, originally started this project back in 2012 called Despite These Marks. And I will tell you where the title came from in a moment. But, uh, the, the concept for it, it's a devised theater piece that we had worked on um, about HIV stigma. And the, the concept initiated from um, my friend Nicole was in a production of a show by Eve Edsler called The Vagina Monologues, which is, uh, for those who don't know, it's a devised theater piece. It takes monologues from different women with different experiences and different backgrounds and gender identities, all sorts of things. Uh, and it... Um, basically takes monologues of their personal stories and puts it together into a play. Uh, and uh, friend Nicole was in a production of this show and I had gone along with um, actually uh, our friend, uh, Hal mm -hmm. Troni, who is also uh, HIV positive. Um, he uh, came with me to see Nicole in this production. And I believe it was during intermission after like the first round of monologues, Al had looked at me and said, you know, I really wish that there was something like this, except for they were monologues about people living with HIV and dealing with the stigma. And that kind of set off a light bulb in my brain. And when the production was over, when we were done seeing it, we, we hung out with Nicole afterward. We had mentioned, I had mentioned to Nicole, hey, Al came something to me that was very interesting <laughs> um, during this production. And Nicole was like, yes. So uh, we decided that we were going to start this devised theater piece, very similar to the vagina monologues, where we would interview people who were living with HIV, um, who had friends who uh, were living with HIV or family or loved ones. Uh, and then we also would interview um, doctors. We interviewed a couple doctors. And then uh, we also uh, interviewed a couple of people who uh, with the uh, epidemic a little early on when it was first, you know, becoming something in the United States. Um, but anyway, uh, the very first person that we interviewed was our friend Hal. And uh, he uh, then reached out to uh, Hal's sister and his doctor and uh, I was interviewed being his roommate and friend at the time. And basically, we put together this 12-minute short piece 
12 to 20, I think is what it was, um, that we performed at the uh, Kennedy Center American College Theater Festival uh, back in 2012, I believe. And uh, it was received very, very, very well. And a representative uh, from Broadway Cares Equity Fights AIDS actually said that this is going to be the new voice of AIDS. And uh, we got an award for it. We were, we were, uh, we were given a, Hal Nicole and I were given a certificate uh, and of an uh, achievement in device theater uh, at, from the Kennedy Center American College Theater Festival. Then that in turn uh, made us go, okay, well now we did this little piece, let's expand it and reach out to others. So uh, we started reaching out to more friends uh, to work on a full length production. And that is how uh, Howard got involved. Yeah. <laughs> yes, indeed. Um, um, I remember <laughs> when you first told me about making this piece and the, the short version of it that and getting the award. Um, I had only been living with the disease for about two years at that point. And I was struggling, we'll say. Um, I was doing okay physically, but mentally I wasn't always in the best place. And I had to... Getting that diagnosis is unlike anything else. Um, you hear stories, you, you, you know the stigma that's out there, and you hear those words being told to you and I remember when I when I first got the diagnosis I managed to hold everything in like I was I was obviously upset but I held it in until I got to the car and I picked up my phone and I called my best friend and I went to say the words out loud and the second I went to try to form those words in my mouth I broke down and started crying uncontrollably and felt a sense of just, just, just loss and fear and anger and so many emotions because I thought this was as bad as it gets, you know, what could be worse than getting this diagnosis knowing, you know, what I thought I knew at the time. And Ian then when I first started seeing a doctor about it, I was told, uh, we had figured out at that point that I actually probably had it for a couple of years. I had gone through some, some, some times in my life where I did a lot of things that I probably am not, that I'm really not proud of, but I did them. And I've, I've become a better person um, through the other side, but this is something I have to live with now for the rest of my life because of it. And I... It, it it was a thing where we had, we'd figured out I'd had it for a couple of years, most likely at that point. We're, there's no way of knowing for sure. And it was still in there, but not to a point where it was really doing much of anything. It was just inside of me. So I wasn't put on any medication. I was basically, it was kind of like, we're just going to monitor you closely and we'll see what happens. And then eventually, um, as research, it was a, it was a, it's, it was two things. One, um, my levels were getting closer to that point where they usually started medicating people. Was one thing, and the other end of it was research into the medications that had been advancing were showing that if you are medicated, it's almost impossible to pass on this disease. So. It was kind of at that point becoming a no-brainer of if you are diagnosed, you should be medicated because this is how we stop it. And But for me, getting the diagnosis was one hurdle I had to cross. Getting put on medication about a year or two later was a whole different hurdle because it made it more real. Now I actually have to take something that, that makes that, that to, to do something about it. It wasn't like before where, oh, I'm told I have it, but I don't have to do anything except for get some blood work done. Now I have to take a pill. And 
granted in the grand scheme of life taking a pill is not much of anything to have to to work through this hell and i came to realize that later hell i have to take pills every day yeah exactly <laughs> you have to take pills every i like it, it's it was kind of i i've joked it over time about how like I've, I've gotten on enough medications at this point in my life that I feel like I'm the stereotypical, like, you know, 60, 70 year old who has to count out their pills in the, in the little container every morning. Um, and I just hit that in my twenties instead. But suffice to say, it was very difficult on me emotionally and I wasn't sure who I could tell and who I could trust for a long time. And then I heard about this project. And I was very excited about this because I'm like, people need to know what it's like to go through this and what it's like to endure the stigma and not know who you can talk to and who you can trust. And then lo and behold, they decide, uh, you guys, I should say that they um, decide to make it a full piece and invited me to do an interview for it. Um, and I still remember doing the interview for it too. Yeah. I think I interviewed you in your car. It was in my car. I remember I had it a little had my recording device out and uh, you just yeah you um, were in the passenger seat and I was literally driving us somewhere I don't even remember where it was but I had been driving to Hal's actually it might have been that seems very likely um, the nice thing at that point obviously um, you had known about my. Um, diagnosis for quite a long, quite a time at that point. Um, so here was this moment where I had somebody I trusted who was going to take my words and do something with them. And I didn't even know what I was going to say at that point, but we had a conversation and it was, it was just felt good to get all of that out. Um, a very cathartic experience for a number of reasons, but even just the interview was there, um, as a catharsis and then knowing that it was going to be part of this production, um, and speaking of, of production, l l let's talk about that a bit about how it was like for, for you and Nicole and, and everyone involved to take the um because the pile of 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 interviews and and information you had to bring it together into one piece of art oh my goodness well first of all that was very daunting because we had hours i'm not talking like you know two or three i'm talking like I think it was like, I think we calculated it. It was like 40 hours of just people talking. And that's a hard thing too. Cause it was like, first of all, let me, let me, let me rewind really quick. <laughs> um, each and every one of the interviews, I think were cathartic for the people that talked to us, which was really, really great. And it was also really good to actually like be able to experience that. Now it wasn't necessarily, I mean, it was cathartic for us in ways and I can get to that portion later, but just hearing people being able to tell their story and us asking them questions and just being able to open up, I could tell was very cathartic for, for a good deal of people. And initially the project was, I mean, uh, Actually, the project was supposed to focus on people that we knew, friends, people in our community. We had to branch out eventually just because it was hard for us to tell certain stories that we needed to tell with just the people that we knew. But um, anyway, um, it, was, it, was, it was a great experience. We got to hear so many uh, just wonderful stories. They were hard sometimes, but they were also very touching, also very empowering. And it gave us a lot of boost to, like, put this piece together. So once we had all of those interviews, we had to go through and transcribe them, which was, it was a pain. <laughs> As a <laughs> social was, scientist yeah. who's had to do this myself, yeah, it's, yeah. Um, it's, it's a wonderful thing to do, especially when you know that your work is going to impact people. 
but it's it's daunting. It's intense um, yeah. to to take all of this 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 wonderful kind of footage or, or just um, data and have to transpose it into something that is consumable at that point. Yeah, absolutely. And the thing is, we had to type down the entire story. I mean, I guess we didn't have to because we could listen to the parts, but it was there so we could actually go back and read and see, okay, what can we put into these like these these pieces? Because um, what we ended up doing was, while we did have some monologues, it was also kind of had scenes that were based around certain kinds of themes. And we took bits and pieces from different interviews to create scenes. So it was really... Um, it was neat, but it was also um, very, very difficult because we had to go back and be like, okay, when did when did Hal talk about uh, when he first had to start taking medication? Uh, when did you first start? And then seeing like, okay, who has different perspectives that we can put into this particular scene so we can kind of encompass all these different aspects of what it means to, you know, start taking medication or uh, we did a scene about dating. We did a scene about stigma on uh, a, a, a gay dating apps, which I don't even want to talk about because it makes me sick. And, um, <laughs> yeah. Uh, and, yeah, stuff like that. Um, so, um, but it, it was it was definitely definitely uh, definitely an experience, and uh, I really enjoyed. Um, I really enjoyed just hearing people and also the fact that they felt comfortable enough to share with us, if that makes sense. Definitely. I, it's an interesting thing and it, it's something I want to kind of bring up because I feel there is something at the heart of this about this catharsis through art that is a universal theme. And I know, um, Obviously, this type of piece had many layers of that for those who were being interviewed, for those who were acting in it, for those who were, you know, you guys creating the screenplay and such. Um, but this is indicative of so many other things. Um, I know, um, turning over to you, Rose, as somebody who has, um, you know, as an artist yourself, granted in different means but what is it meant for you as far as art as that kind of like outlet for you and whether it be for your own emotional feeling or creating art for somebody to give them for their emotions oh my gosh yeah like when i was um there there was a period of time where i was actually homeless and um living in a catholic worker house and, um, like, pretty much my main outlet was drawing. And I think, like, looking back on some of my old pieces, you can definitely tell I was going through stuff. Just because I tend to go use very heavy, like, black and whites and grays. And, like, very rarely did I use color. <laughs> um, so, along that point... How does it make you feel looking back on that now, all these years later? Like, if you see one of those pieces, what does it bring up for you? Sadness, but for a different reason. Okay. Like, mostly because, like, I've had a lot of art block myself these days, but I feel like a big part of it is, like, I'm not in as bad of a place as I was back then. Like, now, like, I know who I am, like... I'm with my significant other like I have a lot of stuff going for me where I didn't then and I think in a weird way it's making it so like I I don't know how to channel it into drawing anymore <laughs> <laughs> I, I lost I lost that fuel <laughs> that can be a double-edged sword but there is definitely ways to create art from a positive angle oh my gosh yeah it's yeah true. I think it definitely sometimes it's easier because for projects like this, and especially ones like Despite These Marks, it obviously comes from a place of people need that outlet. And I think a lot of times that's what manifests through various forms of art. And we see it in a lot of pop culture. Um, you know, we're talking about um, 
theater and and um, artwork as far as for for drawing or or painting, creating creating art in those means. But it also can apply to various other things, you know, whether it be film, TV, um, you know, all different kinds of of mediums of expression where there's a number of things that different people can put into a specific product product that or project um if i can word correctly today that always kind of reminds me of uh, what was it the matrix about how it has like a lot of allegories to being trans <laughs> well and there's yeah and then the there's and then the creators ended up being trans themselves well so. and there's there's that thing is a lot of times you find different things and different people will pull different things from it and coming back to the Despite These Marks conversation, I mean, I think that's definitely something I know we've had discussions on this in the past, but where you had different stories where different people could associate with this one piece in multiple different ways. And I guess, and what your takeaway from all of that was, Josh? In regard to Despite These Marks, just different people, uh, yeah. what they took away from it? Yeah. Well, um, starters, uh, like I said, um, we uh, did the, the our initial uh, short piece at, uh, at the Kennedy Center American College Theater Festival. We had somebody from Broadway Cares Equity Rights AIDS who was uh, who, who is HIV positive, who is part of Broadway Cares that's actually like you know, got involved with the organization. But uh, he uh, came to us afterward and said, you know, these are the kind of projects that he wished that he had access to, you know, that sort of thing. And uh, like just previously, and uh, he had a quote, I wish I should have been more prepared for this to have some quotes that I could have pulled from the actual things. But uh, an abridged version of what he said to us was that he didn't think it was just serendipity that we met at Kennedy Center American College Theater Festival, that it was it was, uh, you know, fate, you know, <laughs> um, that it was, that it was a, a, important. And um, I got all feedback from it. First of all, it was, uh, for example, um, Hal, who uh, had a lot of trouble talking about it with his family and was very, he's very closed off. And I mean, a lot of people were like that, you know, because it's not an easy thing to talk about. But for him particularly, I remember had so much trouble with his family and his entire family came to see the full length production i remember and it just started a lot of conversation between him and them and they had this they as people who were not living with it were able to through this artistic medium experience what he was feeling in a different way um and take something away from that and even if you don't know the people in the play, like the different people, I actually don't personally know. I mean, I, I know them from interviewing them, but there are a good handful of people that we interviewed that we never met in person. Um, we just reached out to because we needed some more stories. But even not knowing them can sit down and listen to their stories and take some very important things away uh, about what it means to be a good friend, what it means to be a good ally, what it is that people experience what you might not have thought about before because everybody, the, the main thing that you take away from, you know, oh, this person has HIV, oh, that's, that's you know, oh, it's an illness, that's, that's, that's you know, scary or, or whatever your mind goes to. You don't take away the other things that we discussed, uh, like you had mentioned before with the um, treating uh your doctor say treating the the social aspect of it over the mm -hmm. what you said yeah um so uh that was definitely one takeaway um and then another cool thing um actually i can go into this with you a little bit <laughs> and we get into the fun bit of the rehearsal process <laughs> we had okay. where we had the art where we had the actors Playing these people who um, some of them actually knew, some of them didn't. And then uh, just getting, I, I, sorry, I'm like, I'm trying to collect my thoughts here because there's You're just good. so much. There's so much. Uh, so when we were having rehearsals, when we got the actors for the full length production, 
uh, there, there's a handful of people where we were like, you know, these people like, um, example is, uh, Celia Chung. Are you familiar with her? Mm -hmm. She's an actor from, uh, well, you're familiar with her from the play definitely too, oh, yeah. but she's like <laughs> an activist from California. We have never met her and she's actually a pretty big deal. Um, <laughs> she's like, like a renowned activist she was uh her story was featured in a ryan murphy uh movie actually <laughs> um a mini series um anyway but then you know you have those people that are featured in the play when when i came to the actors and said okay a couple of the main characters in this piece are people who are very dear friends of mine they were like oh my goodness and when i mentioned to them that they were going to be meeting guys it was very, as an actor, I'm sure it was very interesting. Um, it was also, I think there was just, there was some catharsis in that too. Um, I actually might turn the tables on this a bit, you, and ask you a question, even though it's your podcast. No, so, go ahead. I just, so like, for example, the actor who was playing Hal, I was like, Hal's one of my best friends and I live with him. He's going to come into rehearsal one of these days and just, you know, see. And he was intimidated at first because he was telling this other person's story, but he was also really excited to like meet him and you know, hear it straight from the horse's mouth to speak. Um, and it was a very interesting experience when the actor who was playing Hal met the actual Hal and they met and I could tell it influenced his performance and also even gave him more of an ability because as an actor, you have to empathize. Mm -hmm. And it's not hard if you're an empathetic person, you know, it's not hard to find bits of things to empathize with actors, but I can imagine it's even, even more feelsy and emotional when you actually meet the person that you're playing. But anyway, to flip the script around, I was going to ask one of the people that we brought in to meet the actor, or the person that they, they were playing, was 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 you yeah <laughs> uh, i wanted to know how how you felt about that whole experience <laughs> was, um i mean i was definitely excited to be a part of this project um you know doing the interview um from the get-go knowing that um what i said was going to be in the piece and that on top of that somebody was going to be playing me on stage um i will say I, I mean, the rehearsal was great. I got to come, um, I got to meet the actor who will be playing me um, for that first one. Um, and we'll discuss the the various other iterations you've been able to put together since then. But I think it was great because it was kind of uh, the one thing that I think w is helpful in that regard is you can look at a character sometimes and especially for somebody, if you're at home consuming media, you see something on TV and a character can come off as like larger than life. Like it's not real, but this was based off of real stories from real people. And then having that moment of us getting to meet the actors who would be portraying us um, was very much like a... It, it, it makes it more real, but in a very good understanding way um, where I really didn't, I don't feel like, like, cause the one thing I was very, very much going about was I didn't want to come in and tell somebody how to play me. Um, cause I felt that would be kind of rude for one thing. <laughs> and, um, and I think I just came in and I was myself and I had conversations and I think it translated pretty well to the finished product. I have to say. Did they get your laugh down? Yeah. It's hey, almost sir. impossible for anyone to get my laugh down, but. Um, oh no. Well, you can't emulate a person exactly how they are, but I just remember in rehearsals with the actor who was playing you for the first production, I remember there were moments where he would do things and I was like, oh my gosh, that reminds me so like he'd do, <laughs> he'd do little things and I'd be like, oh my, oh my gosh. Yeah. Uh, same thing with the actor playing Hal, but like, you know, deliver something in a certain way. And I was like, geez, Hal would be so freaking proud right now because like, you're, you're, you're so, you know. They, they all fun. did a wonderful job. Um, it was great. Yeah. I will tell anybody listening that if you want a surreal as hell experience, it is to 
sit in the audience at a, at a, at a, at a production where somebody is playing you on stage in front of you saying your own words. I, it was surreal and I started crying in the audience, but not, no, I was not upset. It was, it was, catharsis is really the, the, the best word I can use. And I know I've used it so much during this podcast, but it was so cathartic to just, it was like a release. It was, it wasn't just me talking about something. It was bigger than that. It was more than that. Somebody else was able to kind of embody what I was going through and present it to other people. And it was almost overwhelming, but in all the best ways possible. I I wept, but I was so happy um, that this was out there. Um, nobody wants this... Nobody wants HIV to be a thing still. Nobody wants it to be out there. But we need to get, we need to deal with it and we need to make a better tomorrow. And we can't do anything unless we talk about it. Um, we, we've, we've had these conversations on the podcast and, and in various things that I've done about just sometimes you just need to start the conversation. And I think that was the biggest thing about this piece is getting to see the conversation progressing in real time right in front right before my eyes and my words were a part of it and that's i don't think i'll ever have an experience quite like that ever again i really don't it was it was something i'm really glad that we were able to like have that experience i i I well, I'm going to take a moment to say now that i'm really appreciative that you were a part of it and 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 you know to make peace possible but i also am just it's really great to hear that overall like all around particularly for those who we knew if that makes sense or mm -hmm. know people that we know like it was nice having those outside interviews because it helped us like make it full and then we could deal with t topics like hiv criminalization and all you know all the stuff that we haven't at, like in our little circle had had to deal with just from a personal aspect, having people that we know in our lives that are our friends who have been struggling and also just needed that creative outlet, it was very fulfilling to be able to celebrate as a community people's stories and have them be part of it, but then also you know, and be able to experience it in a way that is cathartic. I know we keep using that word. <laughs> it's the and, best word for it, though. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. It is. It is. And, and and artistic. It's, you know, it's it's one thing to go up and do a speech somewhere and do a presentation. To do a theatrical performance where it's an immersive experience. I, I, I always will hold that, you know, theater, you can't can't have a production and cut bits and bobs out to make it comfortable mm -hmm. um these kind of pieces it's what i like about the vagina monologue it's what i like about the laramie project the laramie project was another one that really really like yeah. we were inspired by when we did this um, the vagina monologues actually because the laramie project was more of a, a piece uh Less about monologues and more about kind of like scenes and things like that. But, um, oh yeah, yeah. Oh. It, it's there's it's it's something special. I I I, I agree. Yeah. Now, it, like I know it's interesting because like back in the day when I actually went and saw, despite these marks, like. At the time, like, I knew basically nothing about HIV, and it was, like, I will say, like, it was very informative of, like, what y'all were going through, and, like, yeah, it, it was it was interesting for someone that, like, hasn't been exposed to that at all. <laughs> yeah, um, 
I think that's that's the other the other side of this is that the piece was I think ultimately it served multiple purposes, but I think at the end of the day was to just generate more dialogue, really. Absolutely, yeah. I remember it early. Oh, sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off. <laughs> I was just saying, I, I, I would say it succeeded. <laughs> and that's, and it's an interesting. Glad. Yeah, it's, it's, because when you saw that, gosh, do you, I don't know if you remember when that was. Um, the one that she's talking about is the one we did at uh, the main theater. Um, oh, so that was, uh, that was our final product, is what I like to call it, because that was the one that we were really, that was how. That was the piece that we really like we were striving for that performance was it was so oh. good <laughs> thank you um, and, and i think so too i think everybody did fantastic with it that piece uh, that was in 2015 i believe 15 checks out uh 2015 world aids day we did it yeah it was the I, last I knew it production was either 15 that we actually or 16 did. and um because i know at the time yeah, it might have been six Oh, 16? I think it was... It was 16. I thought it was 2015 because... Hang on. I have a good way to check this. <laughs> um, um, either way, uh, 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 we were talking about... Uh, oh, goodness. Words. Language. Uh, information. Mm -hmm. I remember uh, one of the notes that we got from the ACTF critic, which um, was a note that we did not take, which is a note to people to say, hey, sometimes critics won't get what you're trying to do, and uh, it's okay to not listen to them if you uh, have a particular vision in mind. Now, that's not saying that constructive criticism isn't good, but if, it's, if they're not understanding what you're trying to do, it's better to try and for your vision. One of the notes that we got was to take a lot of that informational aspect out of it, which I think that those bits and bobs were important. Now we modified them for the 2000, I'm trying to look it up right now, but that production, 2015. Okay. Uh, it was 2015. Um, we, we modified the informational bits and bobs, like the doctor and the facts. But we still kept them in because we knew that that was an important thing for people who didn't know the basic facts coming into it. You, you know, if you I get what I'm. Oh saying. yeah, no, absolutely. It's because that that's the thing is, and, and speaking as somebody who I, I feel I try to do with a lot of my content is that you can be educated and entertained at the same time that there's, Absolutely. A, 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 there's a beautiful balance you can strike where not everything has to be... It's kind of that, that great balance of life and, and, and something I've spoken about, about how life, a big part of life is balancing your emotion and your logic and your brain. And where if you had a piece that was solely driven from the logic perspective, it wouldn't be as strong. And if it was solely driven from the emotional perspective, it wouldn't be as strong. But the balance between them makes the ultimate um you know product that's going to connect with the most people and i think create the most impact going forward um yeah and i know because it was interesting for me to think about how things have changed over the years and evolved um with certain things because when that production happened and i took you to see it rose mm -hmm. um so leading up to it I mean, it was a big deal to me. Um, at that point, we there were there had been a few different um, iterations of it, which I want to talk about them in just a bit. But one of the big things um, with that one, like this was, like you had alluded to, Josh, about this was like the big final project of the like the fully realized version. And I had made this was about a year after um, I joined the Brony fandom, actually, and I had met all these new friends and all these people who I didn't know when we did the original piece and I, and you know, and they didn't know they knew me at that point, you know, we'd been friends for months or probably about a year, depending on who it was at that point. But 
this was part of my life that probably a lot of people weren't 100% familiar with. So I said, everybody, this is important to me, and I would love to bring as many of you as possible. And I think we got we got a fair amount of people there. We, we got a crew. And you being part of that crew, I mean, granted, I'm asking you to remember something five years ago, but what did that say to you about, like, my friend wants to show me this piece of his life. I mean, I felt honored, of course, but... <laughs> and at the time, like, this was long before Rose and I were a couple. <laughs> we didn't get together for a couple of years after that. that was, I mean, that was before I was out. <laughs> yeah, so a lot had changed, but that was definitely... It was definitely experience. Mm-hmm. Um, and one thing I said, I just had alluded to, is I wanted to talk about some of the different iterations um, and the impact within there because uh, we talked about, mainly talked about the initial um, two productions being the 12-minute the version and then the original piece um, at the university and then the final product. But in between, there were a couple of different iterations and I wanted to ask you about what that was like for you as kind of one of the, the, the big driving force behind this to take this piece and mold it into different formats um, over that kind of couple of year period there so the project could continue? Uh, it was really interesting, actually. And it was also kind of wanted it to grow. We always knew that that production that we did in 2013, I think at Millersville, was not going to be the end all be all because first of all, it was a stage reading. It wasn't fully staged. Um, and there were still things that we wanted to people reaching out to us, wanting interviewed for it. And there were still things that we wanted to talk about. Um, we knew that there was more, more stories to be tell, told. And we also knew that there were more ways to present these stories. Uh, so as we were getting more and more interviews, is to kind of let them trickle in and find ways to work them in the piece. We workshop them in other places. Uh, we had a couple of performances downtown in Lancaster that were just monologues. Um, we did a performance at a restaurant called The Seed, which sadly no longer exists. Um, oh, but uh, It was good, too. I love their food. Oh, yeah, it was fantastic. And, uh, you know, we did that. We did a couple, I think... Uh, I think we did some monologues at Rabbit and Dragonfly. Um, one of our big, big, big accomplishments that I have to say was um, before our big production, I think, yeah, before our big production in 2015, um, we did it at Effort of Maine. Uh, we actually took excerpts. Uh, Broadway Cares Equity Bites AIDS. They do these variety shows, raise money for um, HIV research and and support for people living with it. And um, we do these variety shows. And one of them was about uh, basically the future voices in the fight against HIV and AIDS. And they took excerpts from our play and they performed it in New York City. Um, at um, the cutting room, I believe is the name of the of the it venue. Was the cutting room? I and, remember. And and that was pretty cool. Because um, talk about surreal. Now they only took bit the bits with me, Hal, and Nicole, um, uh, from the play, which I understand because they were trying to focus on the creation of the play, and that kind of origin story. But uh, kind of earlier when you were talking about how surreal it is to sit uh, um, sit in an audience and watch somebody read your words. I actually got to experience that then because in turn then at the cutting room, I had somebody who played me. It mm -hmm. was very, very strange because I didn't write that. That was like, those were my words that they took. So it was like, it was like oh, the tables have been turned. <laughs> um, but uh yeah, it was. It, it helped in the growing process. It also helped to kind of get the word out. We had tables at Pride. Um, you're reminding me of how much I want to revisit this project again. <laughs> it it was it was quite the experience. Um, the you know the other flip side that I know you and I both got to experience with it is at one point or another playing ourselves. 
I was actually about to bring that up because I think at the seed you played yourself, right? I played myself then, and then the other full length version we did at the um... Unitarian Universalist Church. I had totally forgot about mm -hmm. that. It reminded me of that. That was we did do that. We did a reading of it for uh, the Unitarian Universalist Church in Lancaster for a weekend thing that we had called Queerter. <laughs> which i really enjoyed um yeah, yeah, so, yeah. <laughs> would you like me to talk about my experience playing myself or do you sure. would you like to yeah no you go you go first um because like meanwhile like while i've dabbled in acting over the years you've done a lot more of it than me so <laughs> yeah well um, i actually had the distinction of playing myself twice um the first production that we did at Millersville, and then at the Unitarian Universe. I might get emotional. I'm sorry. Oh, it's um, okay. No, I'm um, kind of. I've been a little emotional revisiting all of this. It's um, it was. It's the reason I wanted to do this episode because it, it. When it occurred to me that it had been ten years since my diagnosis, I was thinking back on what it's been like to live with it over these years, and. It's such a non-factor in my life now, but it took these stepping stones to get there. And I think that's important to talk about is we got to going through this through art. It's an emotional process that means something. Absolutely. It's, about, it's why I like art so much, you know. I think, you know, we can get into that. Um, <laughs> I, won't, I won't pontificate about that quite yet, but I definitely agree. Um, kind of relating to the whole Arctic thing um, of it was one of the big arcs in the play. Sorry. Oh, I allowed to swear. Yes. <laughs> um, oh, um, regard to relationship between Hal and I did a secret from me for a very long time. He um, was diagnosed. I was very hurt. Um, which wasn't necessarily the best thing, best way for me to act as a friend. Um, <laughs> I think I was just, you know, scared and things like that. I, I went through my own kind of process. He eventually told me we were living together, and I considered him one of my best friends. There was this really, really rough period where I was upset and hurt and worried and scared. And um, Cole had interviewed me uh, for Despite These Marks himself about what that was like. It became a monologue in the play. And... Um, uh, in the production, and the thing that was particularly hard about it was that um, the 2012 production, I had to play myself. And there was this big scene where we dramatized kind of uh, confrontation and then kind of emotional um, feeling between Hal and I. Um, it was just a very, very emotional experience as an actor because, you know, you have to, when, when I act and I play characters, I, I really try to get into it. And I've only cried on stage for real, maybe a handful of times. And one of them was, despite these marks, it was when I was on stage with the actor playing Hal. We were doing this scene. And I realized that Hal was out in the audience watching us. Mm -hmm. And... I like broke down on stage and I cried. It was really, really, really tough. It was also very cathartic and it was it made me realize how important it was to have that be part of the, the story because I know that other people have loved ones and friends who are living with it go through that similar period, you know. Um, I thank you for, <laughs> thanks for letting me share that. <laughs> let, me, let me calm down for a second here. You're good. So, I, think, I think the big thing that is is kind of just the big takeaway reflecting on this is that sense of we we a lot of times get embarrassed by things by our past or things that we're not the most proud of but when we embrace the fact that they happened 
and hmm. that we've grown since we can utilize that to kind of symbolize you know what like that it is okay like people are gonna make mistakes and we can grow and it kind of just hits home to you more of like how much things have changed because i know for me um <laughs> the funny thing is as hard as it was dealing with it for me at first when i did um my interview and then and then actually performed as myself on stage um was that realization that my story was kind of more the feel-good story of the piece it wasn't the only one but it was part of that segment and yeah. um getting to have that sense of like realizing that this thing that i not that it wasn't a big deal or it wasn't um an important thing in my life but it made me realize like this is not the end of the world and i can deal with this and i'm not alone and i think that's another thing about having a piece with so many people involved and so many interviews and so many stories is while everybody's story is a little unique there are threads that interconnect between all of the various stories so you're speaking your own story is just part of it because then you realize that your own story is within the context of so many others and you don't have to feel alone without with those feelings whether it be worry or guilt or shame or whatever have you you're not alone in them and that's that's powerful absolutely i i can agree with you and and that's that's another thing that was just so freaking cool about seeing all these stories together because yeah, everybody had really shitty parts in their story. I don't mean <laughs> yeah. far, their story. I'm not saying that their story was shitty. I just mean like everybody had really, really hard things they had to deal with in their story. Kind of seeing the commonality between and the fact that you weren't alone. And then brought up a really good point too about how you had you were you had some comedic focus. That was important when we put it together, too, because we weren't trying to be like, oh, gloom and doom, this is like the worst thing. These Everybody has it so hard, blah, you know. It was, these are the things that people are struggling with. But also, this is just, you know, it's a part of life. <laughs> you know what I mean for, for these folks? Oh, yeah. They're, this they're, is... not, they're not, you know, it probably sounds simple and basic and common sense. Just at a very straightforward baseline that, you know, that it's there. Are no, nobody's people living with it aren't different than anybody else. Exactly. No. <laughs> like, and that's um, yeah, that's one of the biggest things I think that was intended to be the takeaway and was the takeaway of all this is that stigma is a thing that exists and it sucks, but it's a reality. Um, it's this kind of just this invisible force that just guides us at times and oftentimes not in the best way where we don't, you know, we, we, we have to fight against this notion. Um, those of us who are dealing with, and it's in so many different things, you know, we're speaking directly to being HIV positive, but there's so many other things that have stigma. I mean, hell, um, I know Rose and I can talk about the stigma of being a brony. <laughs> that was that's, that's a big thing I had to deal with, and it sounds silly talking about it like that, but it seriously was another stigma I had to deal with. Stigma of being trans. Too. Well, and well, and that's true. There's stigma relating to being gay, being trans. Like, there's so many various things, and then the reality, though, the big takeaway, the the at the end of the day, is that. Sometimes we need to look a little deeper than just these things that we just hear about or think we know what it is. It's that there were people out there who are dealing with issues that other people won't under don't slash won't understand. And we have a tendency as people to judge that which we do not understand. And I've had a, a, a saying that I've said for many years now, and I feel it's true is I realized at one point in my life that there were things that I didn't understand. And I realized because I don't understand it, I don't have all the information and therefore I don't have any right to judge it. 
Because until I know the facts, how can I make a judgment on somebody or something else when I don't have the information? And I, I try to live my life that way as much as I can. And I have my moments. We all do. But until you get to see the world through another's eyes, until you get to experience and learn more, it's hard to really fully wrap our heads around it. And maybe if we could open ourselves up to that idea of not rushing to judgment, we can kind of come together better as a society. I'm getting all sappy here at the end, but I, I mean it. I mean, that's part of the reason why I did I started this project to begin with is there's a reality out there that if we look at what the human condition is and, and how our brains work and how we interact as people and we really take lessons from it, What's stopping us from coming together stronger than we ever have before? Absolutely. I think you hit the nail on the head. So <laughs> um, taking a look at time, I think we're pretty much, we're running out of time. So I'll just say this, if there's kind of any final thoughts anybody wants to put out on the topic in general of either, not just the HIV topic um, and despite these marks, but just art and the, the, the process of and the catharsis within. Um... I would like to add two quick things, if I may. You may. Um, so, again, I think you hit the nail on the head with the experience, sharing an experience with an audience, with actors, with just you know, yourself, uh, is a very cathartic, there's the word, cathartic Um we, we, I, I, I don't want to have a drinking game with this episode, but man, cathartic would be the one. Anyway. Yes, it would. Um, uh, that's why theater is so important. I uh, I think live theater, uh, despite the fact, despite these marks, despite the fact that we can't, um, you know, bring it right now, it's something that needs to, you know, we need to safely get back into. Um, I wanted to share a quick anecdote i have time very short anecdote from the first time at uh performed despite these marks i had in the audience was a friend of mine but at the time in college he was not wasn't a total bigot but he wasn't entirely understanding of the rainbow people we'll just say that um and i remember after the first Production we did at Millersville came to see it. One of the things about the play that I didn't bring up was that we also had voices in the play of people who were the stigmatizers, you know, and mm -hmm. experienced stories like that. At the end of the play, he came up to me and he was sobbing. He was sobbing, and he gave me a hug, and he said, "Touching," and it, you know really touched my heart i just wanted to tell you that if i ever acted like anybody in this play ever i want to say that i'm so sorry and i'm not saying that this play you know, was the, the 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 catalyst that started off his his uh transformative arc as a person i will say that it definitely helped him in the right direction and now he's like a huge 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 like advocate or like LGBT people in general, but also is educated more. And I think, you know, it's stuff like that. That's very important. And that you, it's the other tiny thing was that you had mentioned, you know, overall using theater as a way to kind of uh, go through our stories and, and, and provide this, this education, but also the shared experience. And it reminded me of one of my, favorite quotes from my favorite play, which is Hamlet. And in the play, Hamlet says a line where he says, for everything so overdone is from the purpose of playing, whose end birth, both at first and now was and is to hold as twere the mirror up to nature, to show virtue her own feature, scorn her own image, and the very age and body of the time, his form and pressure, which I think just encompasses why Sharing stories like this in theater is very important. <laughs> now, I will note, 
when we are putting on productions, we we don't we we are not aiming for what happens in Hamlet after the play. <laughs> no, 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 no. Of course not. <laughs> I just I had to. <laughs> no, that's okay. That is okay. By the way, that's that's another. Pl- I said there are like a handful of times that I've actually cried on stage. Hamlet was another time where I've actually openly sobbed on stage. Hamlet's an interesting that. piece. Anyway. I've seen so many different adaptations, including ones you you have been in. Um, oh yeah. And and it's very interesting to see. I mean, all of Shakespeare. I'm I'm I love Shakespeare, but you know that. <laughs> yeah. But um, yeah. In general, though, like I think there's that thing about in theater. Maybe it allows you that chance to step out of yourself that you don't get through most, you know, other mediums, so to speak. Is that you can get a chance to experience an embodiment of kind of looking at yourself from a different perspective or looking at somebody else doing something that resonates with your person. Absolutely. So um, that all being said, I guess we'll uh, we'll start wrapping up here. I do want to thank our guest today, uh, Miss Nova Rose, of course. Always a pleasure to have you, considering I just asked you to come down from the next room over. <laughs> oh, thank you for having me and uh how can people uh, find you um i'm on twitter the handle of nova roselia and uh i think mainly um during covid here and upcoming projects for us are mainly going to be continuing the podcast might have some other streaming news coming up um nothing to report quite yet but uh hopefully we'll have some more soon and uh, thank you again, Josh, for joining us today um, so much. Um, uh, anything um, you have coming up you'd love to share with the folks out there? Oh, absolutely. Thank you for having me. Um, well, uh, I'm currently, again, during COVID, we're not doing so much as far as doing so much, uh, trying to, but um, uh, I have been doing a... Uh, uh, a spoken word series with Theater of the Seventh Sister, which is a theater that I'm on the board for. Um, and that is up on our page. You can find us on Facebook. It's Theater of the Seventh Sister. We also are just uh, www.sevensister.com. I'm also working on my own podcast, but that I don't know when that's going to be released. But check us out. We're Mercury and Retrograde uh, on Facebook. That's, and... Uh, that's and I'm hoping someday that we can work on another iteration of Despite These Marks, you know, I when things that. I, 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 I kind of, like, I realized halfway through this episode, I'm like, people are going to start getting curious about this now that we're talking about it again. But I feel like <laughs> I don't think I've touched the since 2016. Yeah, well, there's a thing, too, because there's always opportunities to update things as the years go on, because that's the beautiful thing about the nature of the piece is it can be updated as time change. I hope maybe we can do that someday. I prefer to, I prefer when we can actually get together to work on that one though. So there might be a little bit of time, but you yeah, know, it'll be a little bit of time. But um, we'll definitely and uh, in the comments section we'll have some uh, some links for y'all to check out of uh, various uh, things that we all have going on. But uh, Otherwise, I do want to thank all of you for tuning in today. Um, And remember to always keep friendship magic out there. Thank you for joining us.